Good morning, and welcome in the name of Christ. It's good to have you joining us for this morning's message as we continue to work out of the book of Matthew. Today our text is taken from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Did you know that we are almost to the end of the year? That there is less than two weeks left? Only two weeks in the Christian year, that is. According to the liturgical calendar, we are currently in the part of the year we call Kingdom Tide, or Ordinary Time. This covers 26 Sundays following Pentecost, ending with Christ the King Sunday, on which we commemorate the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We are almost ready to begin a brand new year, starting with the first Sunday in Advent. And there is kind of a bridge that must be crossed from ordinary time to the season of Advent. The finale, you might say, of ordinary time will be next Sunday as we celebrate Christ the King Sunday. Since we have been working out of the book of Matthew for a number of weeks now, most of the themes in our scripture readings have been concerning God's sovereignty and Christ's authority. Jesus as Lord. They are not always pleasant to hear, they don't leave us with very many warm, fuzzy feelings, for they speak of Christ's return and his coming back to judge the world. For those who have grown up in the church, this is one of those texts that you've heard preached on countless times. Preachers have used it for building campaigns or budget shortfalls or to rally financial support for a missionary. It's been a popular text to use almost any time a preacher needs to remind their congregation of the, their financial responsibilities. And yes, even in spite of this, it is still one we need to hear and to heed. The focus of this familiar parable repeats the same theme of Jesus' return and the coming judgment. We can sum up this with one word. Although it's not a very popular term in our society today, the word is accountability. This involves our personal accountability to God for how we have lived our lives and how we have managed the resources that God has entrusted to us. The point of this parable is quite clear. One day we will stand before God and we will be asked to give an account of what we did with what we were given. Are we looking forward to that day with excitement, in anticipation, expecting to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Or rather, are we a little apprehensive about what Jesus might say to us? When I think of what I've been given compared to many other people in the world, I can't help but remember that verse from Luke, chapter 12, verse 48, which says, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. As Americans, we have been very blessed with an abundance of material wealth, employment, educational opportunities, and leisure time. The question Jesus posed in this parable to his listeners was, How are you using the things God has entrusted to you? So what is our first priority in life? Is it pleasing God or just pleasing ourselves? Perhaps we should be just a little concerned about Jesus will say to us on that day. As most of us know all too well, Christmas is only weeks away, and as the holiday season comes upon us, it might be good for us to think about how we are getting ready to celebrate it. There has been a movement in Christian circles for a number of years now to set aside the material trappings that our secular culture keeps trying to impose on us. We hear religious leaders telling us to put Christ back into Christmas, or someone might post on our Facebook page, Jesus, the reason for the season. It seems there are many folks who are trying to get us to focus more on what Christmas is supposed to be about. So what could we do that would help us to experience more of the spiritual side of Christmas without surrendering to the pressure placed on us 
to go out and buy the next new fad toy this year. You know, that Tickle Me Elmo or that Cabbage Patch doll. Remember those? Remember how people fought over them? Some people pushed and shoved other people out of the way just to get their hands on one. And some folks even wound up in the hospital trying to get one. And if that kind of Christmas shopping conduct isn't bad enough, do you remember who Jim Ty Demorius? Anyone? How quickly we forget. It should be a name that lives in our collective public shame. Jim Ty Demore was the Walmart worker who was trampled to death right in the entranceway of a Long Island Walmart on Black Friday back in 2008. Yes, I believe we do need to focus a little bit more on the spiritual side of Christmas and how we are preparing ourselves to celebrate Christmas. A great place to start would be for us to be sure that we spend Thanksgiving actually giving thanks instead of running off to the store after we gulp down our Thanksgiving meal. The Advent season is a time to help us prepare ourselves for Christmas. One way that we can do a better job of this is to put our focus more on the spiritual side of Christmas. So, here are a few suggestions that might help us do that. Participate in worship. Be regular in your church attendance, remembering why Christ came. Also, worshiping God puts our focus on what Christmas is really about. And if we participate in all of the different worship opportunities that we have available to us during the Christmas season, it can become one of the greatest, most enjoyable parts of our Christmas celebrations. Focus on giving. God gave us His Son, the greatest gift ever given. When we give gifts, we are acting most like God. Try giving more this year and giving meaningful and relational gifts instead of just buying something because it's expected of us. Spend less. Don't spend your holiday worshiping at the holy shrines of our materialistic culture. Don't waste hours shopping online or at the mall buying things that the people we're buying them for probably don't really need anyway. If you spend less, you'll have more to give to people who are hurting or wondering where their next meal might be coming from instead of people just worried about how they're going to finance that new iPhone. Love more. In the Incarnation, Jesus enters into our poverty so we will no longer be poor. Think of the ways that you might use the money you save instead of buying the latest new toy by using it to help some of the last and the least. Jesus reminded us that even if we were to give something so insignificant as a cup of cold water in his name, it would not be forgotten and we would not lose our reward. Changing the way that we use the resources God has entrusted to our care will not be easy. Over the course of the next six weeks, we will be bombarded with thousands of commercials, all trying to get us to go out and buy, buy, buy. It may cause us to change some of the comfortable Christmas traditions that we are used to taking part in. But what we might gain will be worth it. We can replace our propensity towards commercialism with compassion. Now, I don't want anyone to think that I'm against celebrating Christmas. I love Christmas. But I am suggesting that we should remember that it is Jesus' birthday we are celebrating, and not ours. I'm not proposing that it's wrong to give gifts. I wholeheartedly support giving gifts to commemorate Jesus' coming to be with us. What I would like everyone to think about is why we are giving gifts. Are we giving it to fill a need? Are we giving them because of the joy that it brings into our lives when we give? Or is it merely to satisfy an expectation that others have placed on us? Do we really need to be even more comfortable and even more entertained 
than we currently are, while one-sixth of the world does not even have access to clean drinking water. What would be more beneficial to our children or our grandchildren's character development? Having the newest fad toy? Or teaching them that faithfully following Jesus Christ often involves delayed gratification and maybe even a little sacrifice? And how else will they learn the principle of sacrificial giving? Who else will teach them how to give? How else will they learn about giving up something they desire so that they can use that money that they would have spent on themselves to help someone else who is in need instead? Questions like this cause us to circle back around to this parable that Jesus tells. How will we answer when we stand before him and he asks us, How have you used the resources that I entrusted with you? How are we using our time, our talents, our abilities for the church? Are we willing to risk our money on God's work? Spend our time doing God's work? Our relationships with others to spread the gospel and challenge others to join in discipleship? When was the last time you had a conversation with someone about God or asked someone if they would come to church with you? Are you willing to risk a little discomfort to bring someone into a relationship with Jesus Christ and into the fellowship of the church? According to a recent Gallup poll, Christmas consumer spending is predicted to be up by quite a bit this year. Gallup is predicting it will be back up to the levels not seen since 2007 or 2008. It predicts that people who attend church regularly will spend an average of about $780 on Christmas gifts this year, while those who never attend church will spend an average of about $830. Judging from these statistics, we can say that Jesus makes about a $50 difference in how we spend our money. Now let's think about that for a minute. People who attend church weekly spend only 6% less on Christmas gifts than folks who never darken the door of a church. If this is true, that means Santa Claus trumps baby Jesus in setting the values of Christmas. I believe that suggests we need to seriously re-examine how we spend money. And bearing in mind Jesus' parable, whose money is it that we are spending? The point of Jesus' parable, of course, is stewardship. All the things we have are given to us under the watchful eye of a master who will one day ask us to give an account for how we have used them. While things are getting better, the effects of the Great Recession are still being felt around us. This will likely be a tough winter for some families, and we are sure to have ample opportunities in the coming weeks to spread some Christmas joy right here in our community. Investing God's money in a way that will pay great dividends is needed now as much as it has ever been needed. And I know there are some families right here in Trenton that will only have presents to give if someone like you steps up and provides them. After all, do our children and grandchildren really need that many more expensive toys or new electronic gadgets? Here is a challenge for you to think about. What if you were to give to some family in need the same amount of money that you spend on your own family. If Jesus really is the reason for the season, then let's show others we really believe that by how we use what God has given to us. This Christmas, let's follow Jesus instead of the culture so that we may be salt and light. Amen.